you have to understand the New Zealand company was not a homogenous group. It was very much reflected English class society. So you had two groups, the ones with the money who owned the land and they stayed in England. And the ones who they employed basically as cheap labour and their goal was to make money off their labour. So they were the ones who were largely, not all, but largely joined the ships to head out to the new settlement. They initially wanted to come south to Port Cooper, we now know as Littleton and the Canterbury Plains, but they were told by uh, William Hobson in no uncertain terms, you can't go any further south than the Waimea Plains, Whakatū. And so they arrive there and they are essentially labourers, they are indentured, they're indentured for a period of time and when they've completed that time, they will have the chance to purchase land probably at a profit off those who've brought them out. So when they arrive there, they don't have a lot of cash and they also don't have opportunity to work because this is a, it's a, a basic trading society without anything to trade. Local Māori are very kind in supporting them, showing them um, how to plant mara, how to raise kumara, um, taiwa, carrots, cabbages, all the uh, things that Māori have been growing there for two or three decades. But when they arrived there, um, there's this idea that it was a, a happy little settlement. It wasn't. It was founded on tragedy. The first ship arrived with the men on board, and they were the ones that put up the prefabricated housing in that. The second ship was the Lloyds, and that arrived, and with stories of absolute horror. 65 children died on it. Um, that meant out of every family that was in the new settlement of Nelson, there was either someone who lost a child or someone who knew someone who lost a child. Um, the women were assaulted, which in the Victorian parlance was meant everything from sexual assault to rape. And they arrived, they were damaged. And they arrive and instead of finding this wonderful place that they can start a new life that was different to the life they faced in England, they faced hardship, in some cases close to starvation, and almost a, a, a dream that hadn't even come close to coming true. And so you talk about, so th that's, you know, the first couple arrivals with the New Zealand Company. The others who came, where did they come from? Uh, they raised, they, they would have town hall meetings where the media of the day, which was these beautifully produced artworks showing, you know, come on in, the natives are friendly and the weather's good and you can grow bananas in the Hutt Valley and things like that. Um, that was said, by the way. And they would basically come round and they would persuade people. They had too many people. It was this idea, we have too many mouths to feed in England, so let's ship them overseas. And so the same principle applied to providing settlers for Canada, for Australia, parts of America and the Caribbean. But New Zealand, you had the chance to provide settlers and make money off them. So as far as the aristocracy was concerned, this was win-win. We get rid of these annoying mouths to feed and we can make some coin along the way because we come along, we persuade the uneducated natives of New Zealand to part with their land and then we will farm it, we will make money out of it and then we'll sell it to the new settlers and all along the way we clip the ticket and make profit. So although they're coming from England, some may not have yep. even been English? Scots, Cornish, Irish. Um, you have to remember at the time, places like Liverpool were, were an entrepot for um, the Irish coming across, escaping all kinds of things, including famine. So um, Liverpool and other port cities of England were very much, a substantial part of the population were Irish. The Scots were coming south, again facing all kinds of things, including clearances, including uh, deprivation from... Um, harsh climates and the enclosure laws, everything. So England was sort of the place people escaped to and then they were offered the chance to escape from this England that hadn't turned out to be what they wanted. So Wellington, Nelson and then later Whanganui and New Plymouth offered this chance to get out and start afresh but start as the chance to do what you could never do in England and that's become part of the landed society to work your own land. So it was a massive promise that for many never was fulfilled. 
You have to remember Wellington, where we're being filmed now, started out with 400 plus uh, settlers. Within two years, there were 80. So this was a, the, the New Zealand company promises were very hollow. And as soon as there was enough money made to jump on a ship, Australia got the benefit of, quite frankly, some of our brightest and best. Um, we, what on kind of on whose mana, on whose land, or what sale or deed was the New Zealand Company here the, in the first place? The New Zealand Company regarded the treaty as an annoying encumbrance at best, and something to be ignored. Um, they were selling land, for example, in the Hutt Valley that they didn't own, got here and hurriedly came up with deals with Ngāti Toa, with Te Atiawa and uh, other Wellington iwi that supposedly gained them the right to settle. They did the same with Whakatū and that is still murky. The New Zealand company had all kinds of great ideas like we'll have a tenth, which is a tenth of all land will be set aside as Māori reserve land. Um, but the so-called purchase of Whakatū, which was then extended into Moho, into Golden Bay, as it's always been accepted as a legitimate sale. I have never felt that it was, but it seems to have been done reasonably seamlessly, and certainly with the agreement of Tarapraha, who had mana whenua over parts of Whakatū at the time, the Whakatū iwi didn't share that view and they've always felt that some of the land that was sold from underneath them was sold by someone without the ability to do so. But there seems to have been quite a lot of acceptance of the benefits of trade and the benefits of, of living as, alongside the new technology, the new uh, textiles, the new iron um, the new work that it was brought, and also the chance to develop income off the whenua, so gardens and that sort of thing. So Whakatū seems to have been one of those settlements that had it developed how it was intended, I suspect could have done well. The tents were quite quickly eroded when land was needed, um, and as we're going to talk, part of the Whakatū area was included in, included in that area was the Wairau. And that's where we have a problem. When you, uh, <clears throat> you know, you're a historian and when you kind of read the documents and um, think back to your own tūpuna, um, who, who clearly were open to sharing the whenua and sharing the trade, what do you think was going through their head? What was in it for them? Um, so you have to remember, um, Māori were always enterprising. We did not look at the technology of the Pākehā and say, oh, that is not for us. We would look at things like steel nails and take the steel nails, sharpen them, and our carvings became finer, more intricate, more quickly achieved. Steel axes, we could cut down trees faster, still with karakia, still with appropriate tikanga, but we could take the rako of the Pākehā and make it more Māori because the designs were still Māori. So we looked upon the technology that was being brought as something that we could work with. So Māori wanted to turn our land into even more productive um, land. So bringing in the taiwa, the potato, as well as the kumara, bringing in carrots, bringing in cabbage, bringing in all the different vegetables. To do that, you need cash. To raise livestock, you need cash. To have the mana that was owning a horse, you need cash. And it became quite readily accepted that we would trade part of our whenua and bringing in these people who largely coexisted quite nicely and we would trade off some of our whenua as an acceptable compromise to gain the cash that would then turn us into the farmers we always were, but into specialist farmers, raising cattle. We were great at raising, first chance we had to raise pigs. We became pork experts. You know, we were... We were um, turning out hybrid um, pigs. We were turning out, the, you have to remember in terms of plants, we were scientists. The Kumara line used to stop at Waikato through hybridising of, um, of Kumara. The, the Kumara line moved south until it ended up down at um, Horomaka at uh, Banks Peninsula. 
So we always took the technology that we were offered and improved on it. So when we had the chance to engage and trade, the problem was we needed cash. You can do that either selling vegetables and things, and to an extent we could do that, but the next step was to start freeing up some of the land. Now, there is a problem where the process for Māori of giving up land was not the understanding of what the purchasers held. Because in the past we would have, we'd call it leasehold. And some of the alienation of land we didn't understand was full alienation. By the 1840s, it was pretty clear that that was understood and there was starting to be a tightening of freeing up land and sort of holding on to it and saying, well, how can we raise fees? How can we raise money to do the farming we want to develop our land without necessarily alienating it from our ownership? Yeah, it's interesting because you say that um, Wakatu or Whakatu might not have agreed to some of the sales. And yep. in fact, with Te Reo Paraha, what was the relationship um, between those iwi at the top of the south? It was mixed. Te Reo Paraha tended, he held that he was, had rangatira, he was the rangatira of the area through conquest. In pretty much the same sort of way that um, Waikato Tainui held that they were had rangatiratanga over the Taranaki, which of course in 1857-58, when there was a threat to the land there, they moved south to protect their people. In the same way, Tarapraha wasn't a hands-on, we will hold hui leader there, but he acknowledged, he felt that he was the rangatira of the area, and it was pretty much left to function, and I don't know that there was a lot of difference. Yes, the musket wars, which Ngāti Toa were particularly adept at, brought terrible loss. But that was 10, 15 years earlier, and by then there was Rangatane and Ngāti Toa were marrying, Ngāti Apa, Ngāti Atiawa were marrying into Ngāti Toa. There was a lot of marriages that had symbolised peace, we weren't, the musket wars weren't going to re-break out any time soon. So, was there tensions? There, there would always be tensions. Was there near war? Absolutely not. Tell us about Wairau, that piece of land in particular. Uh, we've heard from Kahu and uh, media that uh, Wairau, because it's just so plentiful and amazing soil, was a really special piece of yep. land. It was the Taonga of all of Te Rauparaha's conquests. For him, I've, I've seen several references where he's referred to it almost as his crowning piece, his, uh, that it was his particular treasure, that it was almost like it was something he was most proud of having rangatiratanga over. And it seems to have always had this place in his heart that... He wanted it to be his mana and his association with it to be preserved. And it seems always to have had that, unlike any other part of the conquest areas. And, I mean, I was born into a matine in Grovetown in Marlborough. I'm biased. I think it's one of the most beautiful areas of New Zealand. And so I agree with him. It's a jewel. Where was he? Um, when, when the New Zealand Company started to encroach on that piece of whenua, what kind of, where are we in the timeline so and where was Te Rau Paraha? Te Rau Paraha was at his pa in Porirua, Taupaupa, and he was, he knew the New Zealand Company sorted. So he and Te Rangi Hayata met with our land commissioner Spain early on to state that as far as they were concerned, there had been no sale of the Wairo. He also made it very clear to the New Zealand company that he retained rangatiratanga over the Wairo. He said that through letters and through visitors, visits to Whakatū. Very, very clear that this was his whenua. And um, he never compromised on that. There was talk of a meeting that 
often is trotted out where he said, add another barrel of whiskey and things like that. To me, that was the start of negotiations, not the conclusion of them. He could see that a land-hungry New Zealand company would eventually see value in the Wairau. Now, like any good poker player, he was waiting for the stakes to rise. He was waiting for when they were talking, instead of blankets and muskets and axes, where they would start talking huge amounts. And Māori by then, you have to remember, Māori were thoroughly immersed in the world of commerce. We were trading with Port Jackson, now known as Sydney. We were trading with Australia. We had our own boats, our own trading ships. We were, um, had lumber companies. We knew about the cash economy. We, you have to remember when Ngaitahu were offered the, the Kemp purchase originally, um, one of their rangatira said it's for sale for five million pounds. We knew that the whenua had value. So Tarapraha was not going to fall for the beads and blankets approach of the past. So any opening discussion was just that. So he knew one day he would have to part with his treasure. I don't think he ever saw parting with all of it. I think he would have probably had some level of settlement in the Wairau that he set aside as his place. And it wouldn't have surprised me as an aging man for him to have looked at the sunshine of the Wairau and said, here I will end my days. And had history been different, that possibly would have happened. So what did he do? He trusted in a process. He signed to Tiriti twice. Now, he's the only rangatira to have done that. I think he signed it twice to emphasise that he was going to be part of process. He'd been part of sorting things out through warfare and had paid a huge price. You've got to remember his own children died in battle. His remaining children had become Christian. He had nephews who were Christians. He, his elder brother, Nohorua, to whom I fuck a papa, had all three of his, ma his senior sons were missionaries. He could see the tide changing in how we would engage. And so, um, I'm sorry, I've just lost no, the thread right. of so, that question. Um, so he signed the treaty twice. <laughs> yeah. And oh, so he was, he, 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 on several occasions, he, he met with Spain at least once. Commissioner Spain was a, Commissioner William Spain appointed by William Hobson to straighten out the absolute farce that was land transactions prior to 1840. And it would end up with 93% of those transactions being declared null and void and reversed. He had faith in Spain. Now, Spain was as slow as a wet Wellington day. Um, he, the process he followed, everyone had faith in because he was honest, an honest man. Te Rauparaha and Te Rangihayate, on numerous occasions, counselled uh, caution waiting for Spain's determination. And what was more, when they visited Whakatū prior to the conflict, they indicated that they would be bound by his determination. Now that says a lot about their faith in a process that they saw that they were engaging with a rangatira on the Pākehā side, Commissioner Spain, and they as rangatira of the Fenua, that they were engaging in a process under Te Tiriti o Waitangi Article 2. So it seems to me that he had faith in what he had signed. And I think that says a lot. At some stage, though, he took a ope over to Waido. Yep. Um, tell us about that. So he, he, it's not that he'd lost faith, he just was protecting. Yeah. He, so first ope goes to Whakatū. He and Te Rangi Hayata actually turn up to the New Zealand Company offices and meet Arthur Wakefield and... Um, name's gone out of my head. Thompson? Thompson. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. So I'll just, say, I'll just start again. We'll sorry. Where would that have been? That's right. He's just having a look. Um, so, Lands Commissioner... Solid faith in Spain, yeah, sorry. So this is late. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. so 
Um, obviously, he trusted the process, but at some stage he must have felt like he had to be present. Yeah, he, so Te Rapraha is aware of what's going on. The New Zealand company were very proud of what they were doing. Every time they did something, they published it in the newspaper. It was like, this is not a good way of keeping secrets. So what would happen is they publish, for example, that there'd been surveyors in the Wairau, explorers in the Wairau, in the newspaper. That would then reach the hands of Te Rapraha, and he knew what was happening. He knew that there was this creeping uh, engagement with the Wairau. So the first thing that happens is Nohorua gets involved. He sends his three missionary sons to Whakatū, and they are all Christian, speak beautiful English, and they basically appeal to the biblical principle of telling the truth and following process. Nohorua visits, and then Tarangi Hayata and Tarapraha and a large, as described as a substantial ope, go over to Whakatū and actually turn up to the offices of the New Zealand company and meet Arthur Wakefield, meet Magistrate Thompson and actually issue warnings that the Wairo is not available until Spain has made its determination. Now Arthur Wakefield by then has been schooled on some aspects of tikanga, Sends, wants to send away this senior rangatira with a gift. So he brings out a, a, a shotgun, beautiful new shotgun, which he gifts to Tarapraha, who accepts it. And this is protocol. This is how you send off a senior chief with a gift. Goes to give a similar gift to Tarangi Hayata, who you have to remember has refused to wear European clothing, refuses to engage with European technology where he can, and he says, no, I will not accept this gift because by, quote, by and by you will say with thus, I have purchased the wairo. So Tarangi Hayata does not believe they have any intention of following process. Tarapraha seems to have accepted and even hint that following the determination of Commissioner Spain, the wairo may become a subject over which commerce can happen particularly not just commerce but uh, conversations leading to some level of agreement. Um, and so, <clears throat> so the, they so go the, home? So the ope um, then heads back to Porirua. Some of them head up and what they're determined then is to establish Te Ahika. So they plant gardens up the Waro, re-establish Kayanga. And what they're doing there is showing this is not just our land, but we're working our land. Then the ope comes over with um, on the um, ship owned by um, Nohorua's uh, son-in-law, um, Joseph Toms, and they bring this group of elite warriors over. And they have heard that the surveying teams are there. So... And really interesting, they show incredible restraint. First of all, they turn up to the camps, they split into two. They go to the different camps and they turn up and they pull up the survey pegs, burn down the Raupo huts, but then they are absolutely clear that no one is to be harmed and no goods are to be lost. So they carry all of the surveying equipment carefully, because, you know, it's surveying equipment, back to Port Underwood load them back on, this, on the New Zealand Company ship and then head back to um, the second encampment and do the same. So they're really, really clear. You are in the wrong place, doing the wrong thing, but we don't want wrong to come to you. So it is that process of gently helping the surveyors off the land, and again, it's clear what they want is not banning them, but to stop breach of protocol, breach of process, to be guiding what they do. Those group turn up back to um, Whakatū, and the Whakatū newspaper, um, Magistrate Thompson, immediately have their cause. They have their just war cause. And if we can backtrack, the last time... Thompson and Wakefield had encountered what they regarded as a recalcitrant rangatira. 
it was Pukawa over in... Um, oh, I'll ask you about, um, to describe those two if I can, shortly. Later, okay. Yeah. Well, well, so, um, so, <coughs> so, so the, the magistrate, if you like, needed an, an opportunity to say so, that Ngāti Toa had not played fair and, he it, needed and it was enough... A, yeah, he needed a reason to arrest Te Rauparaha. He needed Te Rauparaha off the scene because... He, he felt, and I think with some justification, that dealing with Te Rauparaha's Christian sons, dealing with Nohorua's Christian sons, and also Rangitopoiora's Christian sons, that by engaging with them, dealing with Christians, you have a better class of native, and he felt that they would be more amenable to sale. You need those chess pieces off the board, so you need to create a reason to arrest them. And so with this trumped-up charge of arson, he had it. Not that he had ordered the surveyors off. It's really interesting that he didn't even try and say that they were interfering with a legally mandated survey party or anything like that, which was a charge that could have been bought. He doesn't do that. He has one charge. He goes round every um, jurist in Whakatū and has them sign the arrest warrant. And they basically, from then, they are determined to arrest Te Rapraha and Te Rangi Hayata on the charge of arson. And so that drives them to organise an arresting posse. And here's where it gets silly. They have 10 so-called gentlemen, around about another 15 or 16 settlers, who seem to have been possibly merchants, traders, even possibly landowners, but they looked at the group, and it was sort of like, this is still too small. They came across a group of 20 road workers. Now, these were the indigent labourers, the indentured labourers, who had come over on the promise of all sorts of things, and had got here, and there was no money. They had created work called Making Roads. They came across this group and basically corralled them and said, we're going to sort out a problem that will help you get more land. You are coming with us. So there's a group of 46 now, and you can imagine these 20 labourers. It was like one minute we are working with pickaxe and shovel, the next minute they're being herded onto the Victoria. Now, one of the real tragedies is the Victoria was um, anchored there. The Victoria is the New Zealand company brig, and it was just happened to be visiting. If there had been some sort of two-week delay, because the the boat wasn't there. I wonder what would have happened. Because either they would have had to walk all the way there, which is a good 10-day journey, or they would have had to wait for a ship, and cooler heads might have prevailed. But out there in the harbour, they had the means to not only form their posse, but get it round to Port Underwood. And that's what they did. So they, as they're getting ready, the second group of surveyors who had been pushed off the land walk in, and they tell their tale of, Te Rapara and Te Rangi Hayata have ordered us off. So that just fueled to the fire. They set off and then they meet the surveying boat coming back with the third group of surveyors. They take it in tow and again Truscott and others tell the similar tale where they've been put off. Truscott by then, surveyors, these are surveyors who are Quakers, absolutely um, opposed to violence in any form, utterly committed to their Christian faith hear what's being planned, and they're just like, oh my, you can't be serious. And at that point, erupt in this passion of saying, the title is not clear. You can't go and arrest someone when we're not clear who owns it. You can't send another survey party. And by his own words, they disclosed they'd been treated fairly and peacefully. And they're saying, if you go now, you're going to inflame things. You're, you're heading literally towards tragedy. And really passionately argued, to the point that apparently Arthur Wakefield was nearly persuaded to turn the ship around. But who speaks up? The magistrate. We have to go and sort them out because we can't allow the natives to set the, set the programme. Can I jump in there and tell me about the characters of these gentlemen? So first we have Wakefield. Who is he? Where did he come so from? Wakefield is a naval, a veteran of the Napoleonic War. He fought and was mentioned in dispatches on several occasions. Um, for a while I had a, 
um, a subscription to the British Library accessing all the newspapers and doing a search on his name. I was really surprised how many times he was mentioned in dispatches as a man of integrity, of bravery, of initiative. And so he had a, a background. It wasn't uh, Edward Gibbon Wakefield, the architect of the New Zealand scheme, was he was thoroughly dodgy. Came up with a get-rich-quick scheme called kidnapping an heiress, taking it to Gretna Green, marrying her, waiting for her parents to die, and then inheriting the money. And he wrote the whole kaupapa of how to settle South Australia and New Zealand while he's in jail. Thoroughly disreputable character. Arthur Wakefield, by all accounts, was an honest man, a brave man, I think bought into some of what his two brothers said. So and we've got a pantheon of Wakefields. Edward Gibbon Wakefield, the architect of the scheme. Colonel William Wakefield, living here in Pornicky in Wellington. The head of the New Zealand Company in Whakatū is Arthur Wakefield, Edward Gibbon Wakefield's brother. And then you'll sometimes hear Edward Jerningham Wakefield, who is Gibbon Wakefield's son, also resident in Wellington. So there's four of them, and you'll find that in a lot of accounts, they get mixed up. So leading this <clears throat> um, posse is Arthur Wakefield. So Arthur Wakefield made history when there's a memorial just outside of um, Kai Tere Tere, um, still misspelt, um, where there's this monument to where he walked ashore and was welcomed. There's no monument to the fact that 14 Rangatira met him there and welcomed him, accepted him, gave him a feast, as Kaiteri Tere, the abundant feast, was named. Um, he was welcomed there, and so he was the head of the New, Ze the New Zealand Company's Nelson Settlement, and by all accounts was quite an able administrator. He was the one that, when he realised the money was drying up, organised the work parties, um, started drawing down on capital that probably didn't exist, from the people who hoped to make money. He was drawing capital down from the UK to give them work. And he was quite an organiser, um, probably quite uh, aristocratic in how he dealt with them. You didn't get to debate. But from that reflected his naval um, background. In the same way William Hobson as Lieutenant Governor had the same thing. So... Probably, I would assess him as a good man, probably in the wrong place, but he gets sent a deputy. Yeah, so tell us about Magistrate Thompson. So Thompson, Thompson lands in, um, to, <laughs> in Auckland and William Hobson meets him and quite quickly assesses just how valuable this um, lawyer is and sends him as far away from him as possibly can be done. That should have been the first hint. So Thompson goes down via Wellington where everyone he meets is appraised of this intemperate, firebrand, loudmouth lawyer. And they basically shuffle him off as quickly as they can to Whakatū. Now Wakefield greets him, and even he seems to have had doubts. He writes to William Wakefield about his intemperate ways. Doesn't make him a judge. Now, I don't fully understand the difference between magistrate and judge, but he is not promoted to where he should be and where he was sent to be, which says something about the fact that Wakefield was starting to think, I've got a feeling this fella has been promoted away from doing harm right into harm's way. So he's a very intemperate man, and he forms an opinion of how to deal with natives on a very visceral scale when there is a blow-up in 1842 over in Mohua, over in what they were then still calling Murderer's Bay. There is coal being mined by Māori over there for sale to the new settlers in Whakatū. Coal that you could just literally dig a pit, dig the coal out, take it by your waka or sailing boat around into Whakatū and sell it. So some Pākehā started setting up their own coal mines without the permission of mana whenua. Now, the mana whenua operators were, they were not happy with this arrogant 
interference. So being peaceful about it, they took away all the pickaxes and shovels and caved in the workings. Basically said, you know, I don't think you can carry on with this. Just leave us to my Nicole, thank you. Thompson hears this and he's outraged. This is interference with the commerce of the new settlers. So he organises basically a couple of shotguns, rusty swords and what are described as pikes, which is basically a sharpened stick. 20 or so, 15 to 20 men round on a boat round to Mohua and they arrest this um, chief Puakawa and upbraid him in front of all his people. Thompson is so enraged by what has gone on, he thumps Puakawa in the face, literally punches him in front of his people. Then he gives a speech, which he hopes one of the translators is translating for him, about the greatness and fairness of European justice and how fairness is now going to prevail. And Truscott, one of the surveyors who witnessed this, is absolutely aghast and he's expecting a Taua to come and raid Whakatū any minute. And it was only the fact that Puakawa died, he was drowned crossing a river, that stopped that. But unfortunately, this sets up in the mind of both uh, Magistrate Thompson and the well, uh, Nelson newspaper, if you have trouble with a Māori chief, you stand up to them, you thump them, give them a speech, and they will back down. And when we heck, so if we fast forward a year to when issues are going on in the Wairau, they send that party off with the echo of the editorial in the Nelson newspaper. We know how to deal with natives. We did so over a murderer's bay. Stand up to them with a firm hand. They will fall into line. So how did they deal with Te Rau Paraha and Te Rangi Hayata? Well, they arrived at Port Underwood and they're greeted. Some of the key players are away. Um, um, key amongst them is... I'm sorry, I'm going to have yeah, to no, check. Um, <coughs> yeah, yeah, but carry on to get yeah, so your notes. Your notes. Key, key players. Sorry, um, so, sorry, sorry. Hold on, we'll just get Yeah, tell me who the key players are. So, there are some key players missing. On the Pakeha side, Reverend Samuel Ironside who has done a magnificent job of actually evangelising the Port Underwood Māori. Most Māori there are thoroughly church-attending Christians, um, including all of Nohorua's sons, but also Taraparaha's son. Tamana Taraparaha is a Christian and an evangelist. Um, Martini Tefifi, who's, he is the son of Rangi Topiora, the incredible uh, Wahine Toa, who signed the treaty, they are down in Southland bringing the gospel. Now they have been, I wouldn't call it the handbrake that's inappropriate, but they have been the temper to um, the enormous personalities that was Tarangi Hayata and Taraparaha, that they would caution precipitate action. They're not there. Um, so we're missing the missionary, we're miss missing these two senior second level but important chiefs. So they arrive at um, Port Underwood and Puaha, Rauri Puaha, who's um, Nohorua's son, greets them and he is a passionate evangelist, never goes anywhere without a Bible in his hand, is in the habit of preaching, waving it. And he is absolutely aghast at the foolhardiness of what he sees and upbraids them, Nohorua, fronts them very angrily and he has Reverend Ironside's wife with him and he says, you should not go into the Wairo. And the um, Tuckett, um, Barney Coat and the other surveyors by then are really, really worried. When you have a senior Tōanga like Nohorua um, speaking so passionately and so clearly about the dangers of where they're headed um, 
they again prevail on Arthur Wakefield for sensible heads to be. Who speaks up? Thompson. Why? We've dealt with these before. What has he got echoing in his mind? How he dealt with the rangatira over in Mohua. He knows how to deal with these uppity natives. You confront them, show them the strong arm of English jurisprudence, they'll back down. So they head inland, and by then, they're following a trail. And Rawaru Pua is he's walking with them. He's got some of his acolytes with him, and they are preaching, they are singing, they're crying, because they can see this is... You are heading towards a disaster. He sees these 20 ineptly armed, absolute uh, uh, amateur posse members. It's interesting to note that not all of them were sworn in as special constables. That says to me either they were clearly inept to do so or they objected. And so they, they 20% 20 or so, one in five of the guns are not even operable. They've collected everyone's spare guns in the Whakatū uh, armoury, you know, basically fowling pieces and old muskets, broken down. Um, most had never fired a musket before. Most didn't know how to operate a musket. And Rawari sees this. And it's like, the, he's going up against Ngāti Tōa. Every, every warrior, every Tōa, had a tower musket, the very best musket. Every musket had a name. Every musket was carved. Every musket was protected with the firing mechanism, protected with oil skin, finely milled powder. They had carved powder horns. These were taonga. And these guys were carrying rusty, non-functional guns to fight them. And they were just like, turn around. And when they got to Tuamarino, which is an old pass site, Across the river, you have drawn up Ngāti Tōa and other rangatira from Whakatū, from Whanganui, from uh, further up the um, Kapiti coast. So it's not just Ngāti Tōa. They're there to, to tautoko the mana of the whenua and the mana of Tarangi Hayata and Taropraha. I don't think they expected conflict. I think they were there essentially saying, we are here bringing our mana to this process. Tai hoa. Commissioner Spain's process will yield an answer. And we want you to think again. And the fact that you've got these senior chiefs, from, particularly from Whanganui, where you've got to remember 1843, the Whanganui settlement is being established, against the wishes of mana whenua, they can see what's happening and they want this stopped. And so there's all these people except one or two saying, let's not do this. So Te Praha, um, is, I suppose if you want to call him something, he's a war chief, he's a campaigner, he's a strategist, he has a very long memory. Um, he... At times, you could characterise him as brutal. He was called variously the Napoleon of the South. Um, he was a chief of incredible mana, but he was also a very wise man. He never became a Christian, unlike most of his family. But he could see the benefits of Christianity, particularly with the preaching of peace. So... He had a background, and there are still Fano around the Motu, for whom Teropraha is a name that brings chills and tears and hurt, and that is something uh, Ngāti Tōa will always carry. But we also have people like Taiaroa of Ngaitahu, who viewed Teropraha as an ancient enemy and brought peace through um, to the gift of Tuhiwai. The bringing of peace between Ngai Tahu in 1843 and the gift from Ngāti Tō of Te Rapraha's waka is an exchange of gifts. So there were times of war in the 1820s that were nasty. The musket wars you couldn't characterise as anything other than a hideous 
collision of technology and tradition. Um, I have people try and say the musket wars were examples of our savagery. No, the musket wars are examples of interference of technology with traditional ways. Because if you have a fight with weapons of stone, bone and wood, they, it's tiring. In the same way as fights between swords and spears were tiring. The change came with the, the uh, differential in who had the technology. And so you ended up in an arms race that was finally petered out when people worked out that you didn't go into battle with 400 warriors on your side, 500 warriors on the other side, you still have 350 on yours and they have 50 left because of the sorter. You went in with similar numbers and came out with similar levels of deaths. And in the end, it was sort of like a weariness from war. And I think Tarapraha was tired of war. And I think he viewed the signing of the treaty as putting his mark on holding on to where things had got to, effectively holding on to conquest in some ways, which again, I acknowledge the hurt of my whakatū tūpuna. But for everything, I think he was no longer the war leader, but he had a nephew, the giant. If you look at the kimihia, if you look at the um, taiaha of Te Rapraha, it is tiny. He was a very small man, but everyone talked about the presence he brought. Everyone talks, Colonel William Wakefield talked about the presence of Te Rapraha when he entered a room. Tarangi Hayata demanded presence. He was a giant, six foot two, possibly six foot three, wide across the shoulders. He had this enormity that when he came in, and everyone talks about he was, he was a rongoa practitioner, he was a carver, he was a healer, he was a bone setter, and he was a rangatira. Everyone talked about when he walked into a room, he was one of these giants, both in personality and in persona, that he walked in and he filled a room. So you had this man of mana ageing, and you had his nephew, um, Tarangi Hayata, who between the two would have been an incredible presence. Now, it's pretty clear when they are facing across the Tuamarino stream, you've got the heavily bushed area on the western side, the heavily bushed area with on the eastern side where the Nelson settlers fronted up, and they see amongst the trees, barrels, diaha, and then in a the little bit of a clearing, these two incredible rangatira. It's no wonder you heard voices amongst the English settlers of be wary, what are you about? Be cautious. And the surveyors again saying, let's go home now. And my ancestor, the chap Walker, who's clearly looking, possibly holding a non-functioning gun thinking, this is going to end badly. And I'm very glad for the fact that I'm here that at some point he did the Walker two-step, which is two steps backwards and then a sprint back to where he came from. There, there were people there already looking and going, this is a bad idea. Possibly, no one's quite clear on how many Ngāti Tōa and their allies were there. It's, most seem to agree on somewhere between 70 and 100. Certainly more than the Nelson settlers. Certainly everyone bore weapons, and not just bore weapons, were familiar. These were weapons that were carried with authority, with mana. Not nervously held in shaking hands with a broken flintlock. Who else <clears> was in Dero De Paraha's party? You have to look there. Mm. Oh no, just, just uh, so, gen generally, because I want so you to talk were, about Te Rongo and There yeah. were, though, there was... Te Rongo, the... Um, were, so, sorry, were they all chiefs? Were they all fighting warriors? Uh, that's not clear. There were rangatira from Whanganui, and it's pretty clear they were senior chiefs there. So they regarded... There were some from Rokawa who were certainly rangatira. I think you would regard them more than just a war party, but I would regard them as a... Not even as an ope, but a delegation. Think of it possibly as a, um, 
a diplomatic mission where they are heading off. They can see, that, I mean, these are seasoned warriors. They can see a potential for enormous conflict that with losses on both sides. So partly I think they've brought Rangatira from Whakatū as well to try and let sensible heads prevail. Do you think the fact that, you know, you've got senior rangatira there, that they were looking more for a wānanga rather than I a I think fight? so. I think so. And one of the ways it's portrayed sometimes is that they meet and start fighting. That doesn't happen. What happens? So first of all, um, one of the Nelson rangatira makes his waka available to cross the stream. They anchor it to the tree that's still there. Um, when I go there, I mihi to the tree. The tree witnessed our best and worst of our, our taonga tuku iho. Um, but, and that's something we should do. It's, at one point they were going to clear it for road widening or something, but it's still there. They, they anchor it there and Tarapraha and Tarangi Hayata invite Thompson, invite um, all of these surveyors, Brooks, the translator, over to Kōrero. And they start reasonably. Thompson speaks in a reasonable voice about, you've done this, you've done that, you've burnt down, you've illegally burnt down the surveyors' huts. And Tarapraha answers and says, well, I burnt down huts on my land, built with resources, harvested from my land. If, if, if I'm guilty of anything, I'm guilty of burning my own property. And Thompson starts to talk about, I am here representing the Queen's laws, the Queen's book. And Tarapraha at this point starts to lose his... I should point out the first thing. Let's backtrack a yes. wee bit. Tarapraha does something very unusual when they first cross. Thompson's in the lead. Tarapraha extends his hand. Now that is Kopapa Pākehā. He knows by then, you shake hands, my hands are weapons free. He's got all that tikanga, tikanga pakia. you shake hands, we come in peace. So he extends his hand to Thompson, who's he's already met Thompson, so it's not the greeting of a stranger. He extends his hand. Thompson slaps his hand out of the way. Now, I can only imagine what the Ngāti Toa warriors, the other rangatira, would it, there'd be this collective intake of breath of not only did he not shake hands, he slapped the, our senior rangatira. He slapped his hand away. There must have been some of those door almost picking up their muskets thinking, we need to avenge the slight on... There must have been some level of communication from Tarapraha that, that buttoned that down. So this is... All along, there is this dialing back of aggression that in the past, slapping the hand of a rangatira, that's it, game over. There's only one punishment for, for effectively humiliating a rangatira, and that's death. And those who did it knew it. Thompson slaps his hand, all the others shake his hand, by the way, including Wakefield. So Thompson then, he becomes more and more intemperate. He goes red in the face. Which again, you have to remember in Te Ao Māori, you, when, you're, when you're talking, yes, we have 30 or different words for debate and argument because we love to have a kōrero and kōrero rero about everything. If it's worth arguing about, it's worth arguing about, therefore it must be important. That sort of, we will talk about everything. If we don't talk about it, it wasn't important. So there's talk going on that... Someone should have, possibly Brooks the translator, should have said the fact that they're talking is progress. The fact that they're talking is a good thing. They're not. Thompson sees this as the rangatira being obdurate. The rangatira not showing him as the magistrate respect. The, the rangatira showing lack of respect to Arthur Wakefield. And so he's getting more and more heated and at one point, he pulls out of his back pocket the old manacles and says, I am here to put you in chains. Now, again, this huge provocation. 
Tarapraha says you will not put those on me. Let's settle it now. Now, the next step he says, to me, he's throwing oil on the storm. He says, I will let, let's determine now what was lost by the surveyors. If we determine it and I agree, I will pay compensation. Right there. So he's again pulling back from the conflict. He's pulled out handcuffs. Tarapraha pulls back. He's like, let's settle it. He again invokes the name of Commissioner Spain. We will wait on the determinations of Spain. And Thompson, by then, he's on this one track. I'm going to put manacles on this little man, and I'm going to drag him off, and I'm going to drag him back. And Tarapara said, this is not going to happen. I'm putting words in his mouth. But that's effectively what he says. And then, amongst all this, there's the booming voice and presence of Tarangi Haiata steps forward and interrupts everything and says, who are you to talk of putting ties on Tarangi Hayata? Who are you? Do you see me going over to arrest the Queen? Do you see me going over to put ties on the Queen on your lands? This is a game changer. He has effectively said, we are Rangatira on our whenua. You don't get to do this. Just pick up again on booming voice, but not Tarangi Hayata putting you mentioned it would have been Jaropara. No, it's no. Tarangi <coughs> Hayata. No, 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 but he said, do not put manacles on Tarangi Hayata. Oh, okay. Um, <coughs> no, so, so, yeah, so... The, so sorry, I think you accidentally said Tarangi Hayata. No, said, to, to, hang, hang on, Cam. So, so he's pulled out two sets of handcuffs. Okay, just stop. And still ready. And hang on, Cam. I'm just, he's just explaining it to you. So he's pulled out two sets of handcuffs, sorry. Yeah. So he's pulled out two sets of handcuffs and he makes it clear he's there to arrest what he sees as both recalcitrant and rangatira. Mm. He's there to arrest them both. So it's obvious to everyone, Okay. his okay. goal is to drag in, literally in chains Can I, can I, um, can, can perhaps... I keep leaning, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> perhaps just explain that to us. So at the beginning, we understand that it's Te Paraha who's going to have the shackles... Both, uh, sorry, I'll make it a wee bit clearer yeah. then. Um, so yeah, just so it wasn't... I just want to get... Kura there. Ah, Puaha. I need to talk about Puaha. So... Sorry, hang on, hang on a sec. Just sit in. Was me the paper too, please? Yep. Do, what do you want with, with Rangi Haida? Does he come to make a tie of you? Does he go to England to take your land? Has he destroyed your tents or anything wrong with you? Who's your queen? I'm the same as Rangi Toria. So, um, let me sit, just get, get back in there. <laughs> so, Thompson, was he there to arrest just Te Rau Paraha? No, Thompson's there to arrest basically anyone he can pin it on, but he is there with two names on the arrest warrant. Tarangi Hayata and Te Praha. He sees them as a package deal. He sees them both acting in concert. So to him, he's there to take the head off the Ngāti Tōra Ngātira um, iwi. He's there to literally take the fight out by taking out the barriers to negotiation. So Te Rau Paraha, he's trying to de-escalate yes, the situation. Everything he's doing and saying is trying to pull back from confrontation. Everyone's bearing muskets and he's down he's gearing down. Let's back off from this. So into this you have a couple of voices come. So Thompson is so enraged he pulls out manacles. And at that point, Rawari Puaha steps in again. And he's waving his Bible because he's determined. He can see as soon as you pull out a couple of sets of manacles. One for Te Rapraha, one for Te Rangi Hayata. He sees this as a game changer. And he starts quoting from the Bible about blessed other peacemakers. He's literally yelling when other, these other voices are escalating. And Thompson turns in the most horrible voice and tells Rangi Rawari Puaha to be silent. Now you don't do that to the son of a senior chief. You don't do that to the son of Nohurua who is there. But he does. And amongst all of the sound, a booming voice rings out. And stepping forward up beside 
Tarapraha is Tarangi Hayata, who up till now seems to have let Tarapraha do all the talking. And he steps up and says, Who are you to put ties on Rangi Hayata? And by ties, he's meaning the manacles. Who are you to arrest me on my land? Do you see me going over to your lands to arrest your queen? I am the same as Wikitoria. What he means is I'm a rangatira. She is the rangatira of England. I am a rangatira of this land. Now, to a Anglophile, an upright Englishman like Thompson, this is throwing petrol onto every spark. He absolutely erupts in rage at this. Like, there's no greater insult than to invoke the name of Wikitoria. You've just bought the mana of our queen into disrepute, ignoring the fact that he's done the same to these Rangatira. And it's at that point things spiral out of control. And it's at that point he determines he's going to bring force to bear to cause the arrests to happen. And he, t he turns round and in a way that these, I think of these poor labourers must have been bewildered, he yells, fix bayonets. Now, <laughs> none of them have bayonets. It's sort of like, can you imagine these road workers? The day before, they're building a road in Nelson. Now they're on Tua Māori, you know, squaring off against this rangatira and these trained, very capable toa. And they're told, fix bayonets. And they're just, I haven't even got a gun that works. I haven't even got it. And then you hear the ringing voice of Arthur Wakefield, who by then seems to have bought into the same passion as Thompson. And he says, Englishman, forward! Now, this is sort of, this is boys' own stuff. This is, we will show the natives by our might and our confidence and our Englishness. And at some point, someone shot. Now, there's all kinds of arguments about who shot first. I go by William Swainson's uh, inquiry post the tragedy of the Waro, and he established from many different witnesses that someone on the Nelson side fired first. There are several who say that that shot was the one that killed Tarongo, the wife of Tarangi Hayata. But irrespective of what happened, firing breaks out and people fall on both sides. On the settler side, people fall wounded or killed. On the Māori side, at least four, probably six, are immediately fatally shot. Um, no record of the wounded, but included in that is one of the Whanganui rangatira, which is a real tragedy, um, and Tarongo. So from then on, the firing starts, and my ancestor, uh, Cameron Bennett's ancestor, had, are doing the hot foot two-step out of there. The surveyors have already started. Um, the Christian Maori missionaries who are amongst there facilitate the escape of probably half the group, probably more, and start saying, run. And they, they probably threw their muskets away and in their best hobnail boots, sprint. And if you know the area from Tuamari, you know, right round to Port Underwood is a long way to run, but they did it. Then they took to their heels. Meanwhile, <clears throat> Wakefield, with his command of, you know, he's, he's led groups fighting on land with the Navy. He's led Marines. He's led expeditions. He organises some level of defence, basically stepping up the hill at their rear. So the fighting starts across the river, and he starts an organised retreat, and they retreat up. Now, you go there, now it's a bit scrubby and mostly grass, and there's a road in the middle. Fast forward in reverse back. You can't do that easily. It's covered in scrub. It's covered in um, matagari. It's covered in vines. You don't retreat anywhere easily, but they, he manages to organise a group retreat. Meanwhile, they're losing people either to gunfire or deciding that they're not going to stay with um, Wakefield and running. But it's obvious there's a group, around about 20 or so, 
who retreat up and they're running low on ammunition, they were terribly provisioned. And at that point, it's obvious they're up against superior firepower, superior fighting ability, superior musketry, and the only way to survive is to surrender and somehow come to terms. Bearing in mind, there has never been, in the history of Aotearoa New Zealand, there's never been Pākehā surrender to Māori like that again before. So they're trusting in the process. <clears throat> Te Rauparaha gathers them up, and there seems to have been a level of that was unfortunate in the approach, and they crowd them back down to where the wounded lay. And there's some wounded have crawled off into the um, forest. Some won't be. Some of their bodies won't be found for a long time. And they gathered around, and there so, seems to be some level of debate about what should happen next. One of the survivors basically says to the to the warriors, "I need to go spend a penny." And they go, "Oh, good boy!" And he goes off into the bush and stays hidden. And he's one of the few people on who non Māori witnesses on whom we rely for our records. And he records how there was back and forth about what to do now. Partly, I think there were grievously wounded. Partly, there were people who had so terribly insulted Rangatira in taking up arms against them. And then there is this blood-curdling shriek. This giant of a man, this giant of a voice, this giant of a presence, Tarangi Hayata, has discovered that his high-born wife, Tarongo, he married as a benefit to him marrying this high-born woman that she directly had whakapapa to Tōrangatira, our eponymous ancestor. He was given the privilege and right to bring her under his protection. But also he was granted the mana of being associated with her. So it's a mutual thing. He has one job. Look after her. And she's dead. He has failed one of his most sacred duties. And he is grievously wounded in the spirit. Not, not physically. He has failed like no rangatira can fail. He's, his wife has been allowed to be killed. And he is... You can't just call him angry or upset. He would be broken grief-stricken, and as he comes up, he's holding his iron hatchet, and he's seeing wounded soldiers, wounded uh, posse members, and he's laying about them, killing them as he comes up. He is so angry, possibly not with them, he's angry with him. He's failed. And he gets up, and Tarapraha's cautioning Precipitate action. Tarapraha wants to shut this down. Enough have died. And Tarangi Hayata looks at him and says, Remember your daughters. Now, in Tikanga Māori, this, everyone says to, that Tarongo was Tarapraha's daughter. He wasn't. At best, she was possibly a niece, but I don't even think that. I think that the um, relationship was probably second, maybe third cousin. And But to Arangatira, everyone's his daughter. And she's been killed on Tarapraha's watch. She's been killed on Tarangi Hayata's watch. This is a failure in every possible way of the responsibility of Arangatira to protect your women. You know, when we go on, to, on a porphyry, what do we do? The men crowd around. Why? Because the men are expendable. The women are our... our the, the house of the people. And women are our future. You, if you allow one to be killed through what seems like ill-chosen actions, you've failed. And Tarangi Hayata bears that burden and he walks up and he's utterly grief-stricken. And he lashes out with his maripanami. The weapon of a chief, and there are two chiefs there. Magistrate Thompson and Arthur Wakefield. Two chiefs, and he dispatches them with the weapon of a chief. 
The others are not killed necessarily by him. There seems to be a bit of debate around that because the son of the Whanganui chief kills um, one of the chief constables and there are others that seem to get involved in the taking reparations, taking utu on behalf of the hurt Tarangi Haiata has suffered. They all bear a collective responsibility because those women, they would have been off to the side. There would have been children there too. They're off to one side in safety. They suffer that loss and the loss is a burden that Tarangi Haiata, as far as I can see, will carry for the rest of his life. The sheer grief at failing on the... What is, what is his one mission? Protect your women. He's lost her. What is, what is the... Um, you know, when Sorry, you, I get quite passionate that's right, about When that. you think <laughs> about um, the way that they were killed <clears throat> and then um, some are... You know, there were two things that they did. Yep. Uh, if you could explain. And, and what the... So, what the... What the um, you know, why that was. So Wakefield is the senior chief. He is the head of the New Zealand Company. He's the head of the Whakatū settlement. They need to convey that there has been a serious breach of tikanga. They came there, as you said, to Wananga. They came there to talk. They came there to resolve. They had guns, yes, but that was part of the mana of being a rangatira. They didn't go there to fight. They came there to resolve it, and the fight was initiated on the Nelson settlers' side, and there was the dead chief of the Nelson posse. So how the ultimate defilement, the ultimate defiling of a rangatira is to put something noah by his goiwi, by his body, by his... And so under his head, they put a piece of flat bread. Now that's an insult. They don't even accord him the mana of a chiefly rest. He's, they lay a piece of bread under his tapu head, his upuko. You don't insult the head. If you touch the head of a rangatira, you better be a very good runner or very good at compensating. And that happened in the past where people touched their heads and had to give up all sorts of things to bring um, the mana back. They insulted him, and then there are some records that record that a pistol was laid across his throat. Now, the two symbols have such meaning. One, you have lost all your mana. We will lay you here completely bereft of tabu, and we will put a pistol across the throat, your throat that could have spoken up. You are the senior man. You could have used that voice to stop the slaying. And so I think there was deep symbolism in how he was treated. And then Brooks, the very unfortunate translator, Brooks was a man out of his depth. He was felt to be partly at fault for not adequately translating what was going on or not adequately conveying to the settler group what really was being felt and the real potential for harm. So... They record his face as have been being brutalised after death. Again, so he loses the any mana he had of being that intermediary. I think he was held to have been a cause of the failure by Tarangi Hayata and by Tarapraha. It's sort of like, what more did we have to do to dial back from this conflict? Brooks, you were there and you failed at your intermediary role. And Thompson, of course, um, when there's some records that say that he had clumps of his own whiskers in his hands, he was so angry and humiliated, he had torn his own whiskers out in frustration before he was killed. So I think there was humiliation dealt out, and, these, and that's why it became known as the Wairau Massacre. But you have to understand, in terms of tikanga Māori, first of all, the chiefs were dispatched with a chiefly weapon, which was an honour. Later, I think they decided the insult was appropriate. But looking back, there must have been a sense of how much more could we have done? How much more insults did we have to accept before this happened? How much more could we have avoided being where we are? And I think there was a sense of... 
dismay, certainly not a sense of celebration. So they head back away from there, leaving the bodies where they've fallen, bringing their, their fallen with them. And they're met by Nohorua's sons who persuade them this is at an end. The Pākehā, there's quite a substantial whaling settlement around Port Underwood. And Nohorua's Christian missionary sons all persuade them this is at an arrest. Uh, at arrest. We don't need further bloodshed. Let's not hold these Pākehā responsible for the foolishness of the Whakatū people. Let's leave it here. And so they very quietly get back into um, ships and head back to Porirua. Very, like, they're very quiet. There's no sense of, I think they expected, certainly under traditional ways, they expected repercussions and almost accepted that that would be appropriate. Um, there are others who head back up the Waro tending the gardens and the settlers then... Um, under Nohorua's sons, organise Samuel Iron, um, Ironsides comes back and he's the one that gains permission from Ngāti Tōa to go and begin the process of interring, finding the wounded, treating the wounded, interring the fallen. And um, it seems like quite a lot of rangatane and other Māori get involved in this. I think trying to bring probably the modern term is closure to this, to show respect to the fallen so that the hurt of death is bad enough but we want to bring mana to the process of treating the fallen. So they were interred there with saying a service over them and were treated with respect. So there was no more harm came to the, to the bodies and they were certainly given a Christian burial as befits a so-called nominal Christian burial organisation, the what New happened, Zealand Company. Um, you know, <coughs> what happened with Te Rangi Hayata and Te Rauparaha when they returned? So Te Rauparaha seems to have gone completely quiet. Um, he retires to his pa and I think I think he looks at this as he's, he knows he's in the sunset of his life and there must have been regret. And he's reflecting on how much he did to preserve this crown of his possessions and how it's ended so badly. Darangi Hayata is, he's at war with himself. He's furious that it's got to this. And he goes off and he starts building fortifications. He starts building, because as far as he's concerned, there are going to be armed, further armed conflicts from this, because of this, possibly as Utu against this. So he's building a series of fortifications. Ngāti Tōa split there. So when eventually at the conflict of Pāwatahanui, we've got Ngāti Tōa fighting alongside the colonial troops. The 80th Regiment end up at Wellington um, under Captain Howe, and then they go across to Whakatū. Interestingly enough, the remaining uh, magistrates in Whakatū organise for the arrest of, uh, draw up a um, charter of arrest for Te Rangihaiata and Te Rauparaha. How doesn't extend his hand, won't shake their hand, and literally will not even touch their bit of paper, and goes and cancels, looks who signed it, cancels every one of their warrants. How, as a British captain who knew Arthur Wakefield, is absolutely enraged by these upstart New Zealand company people, and it's quite clear already he regards this as a not just a tragedy, but a stupid tragedy. And that's where things start to unravel for the narrative of the New Zealand company. New Zealand company are determined that they are going to capture the narrative. We innocently went over, we wanted to follow the law, we try to arrest these chiefs, and they start shooting and then kill unarmed prisoners. Is this also an opportunity for the Crown to kind of yep. wipe out the New Zealand yep. company because they are competition? No, no, I don't. I think the Crown at the time, uh, the Crown is too in, in bed with the New Zealand company. The Crown have made a ridiculous promise that if they can secure what they regarded as appropriate process, 
the New Zealand company could have a million acres in Aotearoa, New Zealand. They made that promise by Lord Russell. Now, that's an extraordinary promise. He does say you have to follow the laws of the land as established, but echoing in the minds of the Wakefields is we've, we've been promised a million acres. We will get it. And it's really a case of by hook, nor, by hook or crook, we're going to get it. And of course, when the hook doesn't work, the crook will do. And so they have, the, the Crown started out, we, we have this Crown trying to form the treaty and the New Zealand company trying to form, but within sort of the late 18, sorry, the late 1839, those paths become quite convergent. The consequences for Ngāti Tōa are devastating. First of all, um, there's a new governor. So immediately afterwards, there are inquiries made by good people. First of all, there is William Swainson. Now, William Swainson is no fan of Ngāti Tōa. He is one of the farmers. He's a, he's a lawyer, a jurist of some note. And in fact, William Swainson deserves a better place in our history because he's the one that determined that our first laws would be written, quote, for the common man to understand. But William Swainson, at the time, is starting a farm in the Hutt Valley, and he's actually suffered from some of the predations of Māori who felt that that land had been unjustly sold. So he's no. So he comes over and he starts making inquiries, talks to Ngāti Tōa, talks to the survivors, and he comes to an amazing conclusion. He said the settlers were completely in the wrong, that Thompson was foolish, uses the word foolish, in his assessment. Now this is very unwelcome. Next player, so we've lost. Meanwhile, this happens during the... Um, temporary lieutenant governorship of um, Shortland. <clears throat> the next um, lieutenant governor we get is um, name blank. Fitzroy. Fitzroy. <coughs> Sorry? Fitzroy? Yes, thank you. Robert Fitzroy. Who... Oh, so so, yeah. <coughs> oh, excuse me, sorry. Just say the next. The next. So, the next lieutenant governor we get is a remarkable man, lieutenant Captain Robert Fitzroy. He's deliberately resigned his place in the British Parliament to become the Lieutenant Governor. Now you have to remember he visited here. Um, everyone calls it the Darwin Expedition. It wasn't. The Fitzroy ex exhibition, Expedition. Can we start that again? Yes. Okay. Captain Fitzroy is our new Lieutenant Governor. He comes in, he hears about the so-called Wairau Massacre when he arrives in Sydney. There's dispatches just hitting the colonial office there, and he hears about it, reads about it, and sort of, oh, what am I walking into? Fitzroy is a, quite an incredible man. He's resigned his seat in Parliament to become the New Zealand Lieutenant Governor. He had come out in 1835 with Darwin, so he had been here. It seemed that your qualification to become Lieutenant Governor was to visit once. 1837, William Hobson comes out. 1839, he's appointed Lieutenant Governor. 1835, Fitzroy comes out, appointed the next one. So he comes out here and he starts his own inquiry. And again, he talks to Tarangi Hayata, to Tarapraha. He talks to the settlers in Whakatū. He talks to settlers in Wellington. And he concludes and actually concludes in a public speech that Ngāti Tōa were not at fault. The interesting thing about Fitzroy is he had served with Arthur Wakefield. He was personal friends with Arthur Wakefield. So he manages to put aside a long-lasting friendship to acknowledge a horrendous loss, and yet acknowledges that the settlers were at fault. Now this is to the New Zealand company, who are very adept at writing, back to head office, back to the colonial office, they are absolutely enraged. And they start petitioning, coming up with all kinds of reasons why Fitzroy must be recalled. And they're so successful. They're writing to all the, the change makers, all the leaders in the British Parliament, and they succeed. Fitzroy also made the mistake. They'd run out of money. So up in Auckland and trying to pay soldiers, trying to pay for roads, trying... 
trying to sort of clip the ticket sailing land with remember article 2 can't sell land unless both sides agree and it's facilitated only by the crown and at a price everyone agrees and that constrains land sales so he starts writing promissory notes in the display in the treasury these promissory notes where on production of this promissory note in one year you'll get 10 shillings now that is quite illegal I mean back then it was you could even have your head cut off for doing such things so on a range of things he is dismissed from office and who do we get we get George Grey now George Grey has just been creating mayhem in South Australia he is trampling over the rights of the indigenous peoples around South Australia he comes over and he is the one of the most cunning uh, avaricious uh, two-faced leaders we have ever been faced with but it, in 1845 he's not too bad but he comes over and he's just this can't stay we cannot have someone getting away with us sends in the soldiers to arrest Tirapraha he's the sent in and he's arrested um, with a group of soldiers going in and arresting him in his hut no charge no warrant and he's held on a hulk in the in Auckland a prison hulk for 18 months and then he gathers together Martini Te Fifi um, Puaha Tarangi um, and Tamahana Tarapraha and he says you want your chief back sell the waro and that is literally the deal they come up with and it is the deal made in hell a deal with the devil they're told we've got your chief you know how to get him free. By the time they eventually do gain, that, first of all, they put their signatures to the deed. And what are sold? You know, the Wakefield's goal, Thompson's goal is achieved. But what is yielded to the Whakatū settlement of the New Zealand Company? I mean, there's other things to it than that, but that's essentially what happens. Tirupraha is languishing on a prison hulk. You'll see sketches sometimes of him in a naval uniform. There's no mana in that. You'll find Ngāti Toa don't like sharing that image because that's him being dressed and mocked as a prisoner. Put in a naval uniform. Ha ha, what kind of chief are you now? Sort of thing. And he languishes up there and at no point does he call for utu. <clears throat> he doesn't call for, for reprisals. He just is up there and when he's returned he's broken in health and he's broken as a rangatira. Tarangi Hayata has been humiliated in battles where George Grey has successfully caused schisms in Ngāti Toa and so Rangi Hayata ends up retiring to Mana Island carving a beautiful whare and settling there. And it's a sad end to two magnificent leaders who stand astride of our history, our bicultural history, and are known not for the great things they did, the rangatiratanga they practiced, but they remembered for one incident that they did everything to avoid. What does it mean to be Ngāti Tō Rangatira today? For me, growing up, I grew up, I was born just down the road from Te Marino, and then I went to school at Koromiko. And we were told the story of the Waro, and we were told about this massacre. And we were told about this fierce war chief, Tarapraha, who slaughtered unarmed prisoners. No one told our story. No one told about the forbearance. No one told about the mana of Tarapraha the utter bereft failure that was Tarangi Hayata at, the, at Tua Marino. No one talked about that. No one talked about all the efforts Māori went to avoid. Nohorua's efforts, his missionary son's efforts, the letters, the consulting with Commissioner Spain. No one told about that. All we hear about, these poor unarmed settlers were slaughtered. That was the end of a process. And yes, 
The people of Nelson were brutally harmed in terms of their wairua from this. They'd lost the children on the second ship. They lost men and lost leaders from this conflict. Ngāti Toa lost so much more. We lost what we sought through peaceful means to hold on to. You can look back at how we gained it through warfare, and that's a discussion to be had elsewhere. But this conflict shouldn't have happened. So to be Ngāti Toa now, and to be Ngāti Toa born just down the road from where it happened, I drive past there, I visit there, I mihi to the ghosts of there, the fallen on both sides, because I have ancestors who were on both sides, and think, we shouldn't, this shouldn't have happened. And I just look back and I have pride in all we did to try and say, we're not going to let this happen. To try and pull back from the brink. What more? I, I ask those who bring it up, who talk about the massacre, who talk about the unfairness of the slaughter of unarmed prisoners. What more could we have done? Extending a hand of friendship and having it slapped away. These are things you, that you look at and go, what else? So we lost. We were compensated. But the wairo, you don't go to the wairo now and hear Ngāti Toa stories. I mean, rangatane are there and they're lovely, lovely people. Their stories are there. We have rangatira now who are telling the stories of rangatane and Ngāti Toa, ki wairo, And we have a presence there. But it'd be so much more if we were acknowledged as mana whenua and that process had been followed. And it's really sad because it's the there was a place that this didn't need to happen. And at every step, we seem to have tried to pull back. And we failed. You know, it was... How many... We knew what loss was. Tarapraha knew what it was to lose his own children in battle. We, we'd given up that. And yet we try. And people died. And it's, that's what we're remembered for. It, it really, it, when you think about that, how Ngāti Toa started out, you know, being kind of sacked from their people in um, Oh, we, we were bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but like, if you think about, there's these young rangatira who'd lost all of their, um, their rangatira yeah. in battle. And they made a decision, ka mate, ka mate, ka ora, ka ora. I know that was written earlier for something else, but in a sense, that is everything that Ngāti Toa is, is because yeah. you could have become a hapu that had to join another iwi, but your, yet, but your ancestors ch chose, chose to move and to survive. Ex and chose to act in what in the treaty is tino ranga tiratanga, to actually exercise mana motahake, to, on our trip down, that's often characterised by some as a series of battles. And yet, look at who came with us. Rokawa chose to come down and be our neighbours. Now, of course, Rokawa we intermarried with and we also fought with, and like cousins. You know, if you haven't got anyone else to fight with, it's your cousins, you break out. At Te Ateawa, same thing came, Ngati Upper came down. And so... You look at us and say, yes, we were incredible at fighting, but we are also incredible at building relationships too because so many came with us. So many affiliated to us. So many joined us. And um, so you can look upon us as, as some do, that we were a small group with a big fight in us, or you can look upon us as we carved out our own stories, some of which were war, some of which were peace, some of which saw the erection of a beautiful church, some of which saw us welcoming settlers into our area, some of which saw the settlement of Whakatū established without bloodshed. So 
I wish we could. I wish we had that kapapa maintained. Do you think what happened at Waito between Ngati Tōrangatira and effectively the Crown determined the relationship that lies today? It's. I think it still is a shadow over our relationships. Um, you look at what we've done with our settlement. How we've. You go to Porirua now. Who runs the health? We've got our own primary health organisation. You know, you go to our, you don't have to be Ngāti Tōa to engage with our PHO. Everyone's welcome. Someone, Tongan, Pagia, is welcome to our health providers. We've put our treaty settlements into health. We've put it into education. We've put it into scholarships. You know, we've done marvellous things with it. But it's not the same as having a whenua. Um... I think even through, you look at that settlement, what the Crown said to us, what were they talking about? Not greeting the settlers, not welcoming um, into Porirua, not welcoming us with, uh, sorry, not welcoming the settlers with our food technology, our plant technology, our knowledge of soils. It was, remember the warrior. You know, one dreadful afternoon, shadowed everything that happened. And I think that's sad. And I think partly I think the Crown should be doing better at understanding the forbearance that was shown by two incredible rangatira on that day and then the months leading beforehand. <clears throat> In the same way, look at our Ngaitahu stories, how we, through the incredible mana of Taioroa, bringing peace between us. If... If someone with as bitter battle history between us as Ngaitahu and Ngāti Tō can come to peace, what could we have done if the stories had been properly understood between the settlers, the Pākehā settlers and Ngāti Tō Rangatira? But one afternoon, shadows that. Just is this cloud that blocks the sun continuously. And I just, I regret that. You know, at the Iwi Leaders Forum now, you have Ngāti Tōa and Ngāi Tāhu, our friends. We could rehearse all of our shared losses, and there are plenty to rehearse, most of which we acted fairly brutally in. But we don't. We came to peace. We offered the same to Whakatū. And the Crown, I don't think... I think the Crown still see the brutality of that day and don't understand the dikanga that caused it. Mm -hmm.